2020 has been one of the wildest years on record for some very obvious reasons. Um, thankfully, what has kept a lot of us sane, especially myself, is the music that's been coming out. I think 2020 has offered us some surprisingly strong music in abundance considering the mitigating circumstances. So as we approach the end of this never-ending year, uh, I'm going to go through my top 25 albums that have dropped this year. Kicking off the list, number 25, we have Denzel Curry and Kenny Beats' joint album, mini album, Unlocked, which dropped towards the start of the year. Really strong, very animated, playful, short little mini album. Number 24, another very short album was Princess Nokia's Everything is Beautiful, one half of the two albums she dropped. Very colorful, light, playful, soul and jazz influenced hip hop album. Number 23 is Jay Electronica's long awaited, technically debut album, A Written Testimony. Very spiritually and re religiously focused album as well with majority of the songs assisted by Jay-Z. Number 22, West Side Guns, Pray For Paris, one of an absolutely massive collection of Griselda records to drop this year. I think this just edged out some of the other records that they dropped, but they've had an insane year. This one, of course, for all the insane features and the publicity it got, it was a very, very strong, grimy, dirty, straight up hip-hop album. Number 21, King Cruel's Man Alive. This is an album that I wasn't really anticipating liking that much just because I wasn't that much of a fan of the use, but I think he condensed a lot of his material down to their bare bones and I think it worked really well. Number 20, Ben Watts' Storm Damage. Again, an album that dropped very, very early on in the year. This was an album that was so very moody and personal and really concerned with the process of aging and the idea of the passage of time. At number 19, we actually have a film score and that's Ludwig Göransson's score for Christopher Nolan's massive film Tenet. Um, I think that this is one of the strongest scores attached to any Christopher Nolan film so far. I think Ludwig Göransson went in a completely different and new direction to the kind of scores that we're used to hearing from Nolan films. At number 18, we have Don Tolliver's debut album, Heaven or Hell. Very short, concise, but packed full of just absolute bangers. Very, very easy and quick to get through. At number 17, we had Grimes' first album in, I think, about five years now with Miss Anthropocene. Uh, much more moody and textured than her last couple of albums, but I think it's maybe her strongest effort so far. Number 16, we have another debut album, Heady One's Edna. A very big, long album, but full of superstar features like Drake and Future and English superstars like Skepta as well. Um, I think it was quite a consistent debut, especially for a debut album. Um, very personal as well, but full of that braggadocio that you expect in a major drill release. Number 15 is Tame Impala's The Slow Rush. Um, and while I didn't think this was as strong as Currents, I think... What I appreciated most about this album was Kevin Parker leaning even more so into the pop, disco, R&B infused sounds that you heard on Currents. At number 14, we have another album that I wasn't anticipating liking in the slightest, and that's Taylor Swift Folklore. Uh, I think her last album that dropped last year, Lover, was so meandering and self-indulgent. And I think this, she kind of, I, didn't, I wouldn't say she's reinvented herself because it still is at its core a pop album, but with the moodier, more somber aesthetic, I think she explored some of her most creative and interesting songwriting to date. And while Folklore is quite a long album, it's over an hour long, because of the narratives that she weaves, it is consistently interesting and engaging. Number 13, we've got the return of Run the Jewels with RTJ4, one of, if not the most overtly politically and socially charged album, not just hip hop albums, but albums of 2020 in general. Songs like Pulling the Pin and Walking in the Snow and especially the last song, they all sound like the soundtrack to a coming apocalypse. I think, what well, again, this isn't my favorite Run The Jewels album, but I think what this has above the other three albums in this series is that I think it's the most sonically consistent album out of all of them. At number 12, we have 
in my opinion, one of the most underappreciated albums of the year so far. And that's Lil Uzi Vert's Eternal The Take. From the extremely strung out and blown out promo to this album, it was being teased well over a year before it's released, to the insane, strange, otherworldly cover art and the the strange concept of the album as well. Everything about this album is larger than life and that's what you expect from an Uzi project. And when you get to the music, it, in my head, lives up to the hype that Uzi had been fueling for so long. The beats are very, very strange, but they're always animated and quite detailed and Uzi employs a number of different flows and rhythms and his bars are consistently witty and funny and clever. At number 11, we have, again, this, a few of these albums aren't albums that I was particularly anticipating, but that's what I, I love about music is just hearing things that, that surprise me. And that was Jesse Ware's What's Your Pleasure. For me, this album perfectly encapsulates the kind of mood that it, it takes me back to my childhood in a strange way where you'd be sitting at like a house party with your parents, but you know, you're about 12 or 13. So you're not old enough to involve yourself in actually what's going on. You just sit in the corner listening to the tunes. And this is what I imagine those tunes sounding like. Of course, the entire album is very, very heavily influenced by disco and R&B and soul music, like a lot of Jesse Ware's music has been before. But this one is the most overt, full embrace of that full-on disco sound and it's amazing for it okay going into the top 10 at number 10 we have another debut album unknown t's rise above hate this album if i didn't know who unknown t was i would have thought that this is someone who's at least in their 30s maybe even in their 40s because the detail that he writes in these very very grim gruesome portrayals of London gangster lifestyle is, while it's entertaining, it's actually really haunting. Some of the beats are wildly inventive, especially the beats for tunes like Steppy and Tugboy and especially Avengers with KO and V9. One thing about this album, which I think is again very, very underrated, is Unknown T's flows and his wordplay, I think are pretty much unparalleled in the world of UK drill. His delivery, everything about this album is just as stark as its black and white cover art. I, th I think what, what makes this better than just a good album, what makes it a great album is that he shows his variety. There are some slower tunes on here like Ambition and like the interlude where he's singing at points and his singing voice is rather good. I think if anyone is looking for an introduction to UK drill or an explanation as to why it is so popular at the moment, point them in the direction of Rise Above Hate. Number nine is Dua Lipa's second album, Future Nostalgia, which has been recently nominated for a slew of Grammys, and I think it is more than well-deserved. I think this improved on pretty much every aspect of her self-titled debut album, which dropped three years ago. Um, there's a very, very clear and concise and laser-focused concept to this album, and there's pretty much no filler, and that's why it's such a brisk, easy going listen. Almost every single tune on this is endlessly replayable and danceable. You could put this on at a party and just let the entire thing run from start to finish. I also think with Future Nostalgia that she has become even more confident and more playful and more subtle in her songwriting as well. Similarly to the Jessie Ware's Watch Your Pleasure album, this is a very, very open and loving embrace of all things disco and funk. However, of course, there's a fine line between just repeating past sounds and bringing something new to the table. And I think she does combine the old and the new very, very seamlessly on Future Nostalgia. At number eight, we have Childish Gambino's latest album, 31520. And for me, I think Childish Gambino is an artist that has gotten better consistently with every single album he's released. And I think this is the best music that he's released so far in his career. I think on a lot of the songs here, he takes some very, very bold risks, whether that be very long outros or just strange instrumentals like on the song 3222. But I think for the most part, they really, really pay off. His songwriting is the most conceptual it's ever been, especially on songs like Algorithm and Feels Like Summer. The instrumentals are varied much more varied than any Charles Gambino album I've heard before 
and his singing. His singing has always been pretty good, but I think it has hit a peak with this new album. At number seven, we have one of a slew, unfortunately, a slew of posthumous releases that we were greeted with in 2020, and that is Mac Miller's Circles. Now, I found Circles to be one of the most wholly cohesive and emotionally driven and very moving albums to come out in 2020. And I think that would be the case even if you remove the aspect of Mac Miller's passing a couple of years ago. Now, this is coming from someone who wasn't even the most overt fan of, of Mac Miller's music. I wasn't like a diehard fan or anything, so I can only imagine how moving a listen Circles is to his family and his friends and his day one fans. The production on this album is almost flawless from, from start to finish. The songwriting is the best songwriting that I've ever heard in any Mac Miller project ever really um and i think what what a lot of fans will take comfort in is that so much of this album is filled with positivity and joy and looking forward at number six we have a collab album from my guys 21 savage and metro boomin with savage mode 2 i think savage mode 2 is worlds worlds apart from savage mode 1 i think it's better in every single aspect you can imagine of course, Metro Boomin, his production repertoire has increased massively over the last four years, and he has established himself as one of the most in-demand and best hip-hop producers working today. But with 21 Savage, I think when it came to Savage Mode 1, I think one of the biggest criticisms is that he was very one Of course, he has his very distinct, laid-back, monotone sound, but it got to the point where it was just boring on that album. Whereas fast forward four years later and 21 Savage is so much more diverse and clever with his bars and he's able to employ far more different flows as well. And I, th I think th the strongest aspect of this album is its consistency. Every si Almost every single beat is amazing. It's some of the best beats I think I've ever heard Metro Boomin produce, period. And 21 Savage is consistently hilarious, but savage as he should be as 21 Savage. Of course, the majority of this album is narrated by the one and only Morgan Freeman, which just adds to this whole grand, big cinematic film that's glossed over this album. Everything about this album, from Morgan Freeman's involvement to the amazing album art to the beats, everything pointed to the fact that 21 Savage and Metro Boomin had a very, very clear concept going into this album, which I think is rare for, especially for producer and rapper collab albums. I think Savage Mode 2 is the culmination of two artists who have consistently perfected their craft over the last half decade or so. Okay, going into the top five, at number five, we have Charlie XCX's how I'm feeling now. Even before this album dropped, I was very, very excited for it um, for a couple of reasons. One is that her self-titled album that dropped last year was amazing. And two, the concept of the album, the whole entire thing being written and recorded at the height of the current pandemic was a very, very interesting concept. And I think what Charlie XX has done with this album is it create, she, I think she's created an album that has kind of two narratives going on at the same time where she's able to explore all these insecurities and anxieties that run through the album until it reaches its peak by its end. But also a lot of these themes, especially of anxiety and feeling alone, can be applied to pretty much everyone who's been going through this pandemic together. Whilst most of the album is not directly dealing with the pandemic or the effects of the pandemic, it's the themes and the concepts that pretty much everyone can relate to in times like these. And aside from the lyrical content and the concept, the instrumentals are always, as usual, batshit insane for the most part. Um, the opening Pink Diamond and the closing song as well are two of the most in-your-face things that Charlie XX has ever sung on. And I think the one that I was, I was expecting this to be a good album and I think it still exceeded my expectations, but I think the one thing that surprised me more than anything was how personal this album was. I think this is her most personal album to date. And I think while it's while it can be easy to just spill your emotions out 
in song and hope for some emotional response from your audience. I think what she does, especially on some of the key songs on the album, is that instead of just telling you how she feels, she, well, the album's called How I'm Feeling Now, but she doesn't just tell you how she feels. She creates a situation and a narrative that you can relate to, and then you can decipher the feelings from those. I do think it's her strongest album today, and I know I've said that about the last three or four releases. Every time I think she's hit her peak, and then she just goes one step further. At number four, we have... Leanne Le Havis's self-titled album. Of course, this was an album that was a long time in the making. Her last album, Blood, dropped five years ago. So it's been half a decade that we haven't got new music from her or in, in terms of an album. But this is one of the most soulful, eclectic and rich albums I've heard all year. Of course, the first thing that catches your ear when you listen to a Leanne Le Havis tune is her amazing, very distinctive voice. But... She couples that voice with these amazingly detailed and quite complicated jazz slash R&B slash soul tunes. There's, there's something, I, I, I can't quite place my finger on what it is, but there's so much emotion that you get just from her voice before you even get to the lyrics. But that I think you need both of those. And I think this is one of the best written albums I've heard all year as well. Songs like Bittersweet and Green Papaya and Please Don't Make Me Cry ironically do push you on the verge of shedding a tear or two and the the cherry that's on the icing that's on this amazingly tasting cake as well is that she threw in a weird fishes cover which is of course a radiohead song it happens to be my favorite song of all time and what she did with this song is turned it into a very kind of sultry smooth r&b type ballad i think she toes the line perfectly with this cover where you instantly recognize it from its very, very first second. You instantly recognize that this is Weird Fishes, but also in an alternate universe, it sounds like it could have been a Leanne Le Harvest original tune as well. If you haven't heard this album, I implore you to listen to it immediately. It's one of the best R&B slash soul albums you will hear all year. Okay, into the top three now. At number three, we have an album that grew on me so much throughout the course of the year. And that is Jay Huss's second album, Big Conspiracy. I think the reason that it took such a long time for this album to grow on me is that it was so different from Common Sense. Common Sense was very, very loud, very confident, but really, really amazing album. And this album was far more subdued for the most part and very, very textured as well. What I love is that Jay Huss had such immense success with the release of Common Sense that by the time it came to his sophomore album, he pretty much could have done whatever he liked, um, especially in terms of like features. J he, I'd imagine that a lot of people would be clamoring to work with Jay Huss. He could have had pretty much anyone he wanted in the UK game. He could have had Skepta, he could have had Haywan, AJ Tracy, even Americans. He could have had Drake on this album if he wanted to, but he kept to his core identity so much on this album and it really helps. The fusion that he brings with his distinct kind of rapping sound with the Afro beats and swing and R&B and hip hop instrumentals is a match made in heaven. Every single song on this sounds like it belongs. It's very, very easy, brisk listen. It's only about 45 minutes. And it felt like he chose his features very, very meticulously and very carefully. When you hear the way he raps or sings on certain songs and the way he delivers his bars, you can tell that he hasn't just spent 10 or 15 minutes writing this verse. It's a verse that's been heavily, heavily scrutinized and rewritten. And it shows in just how strong pretty much every single one of his verses are on this album. I think if Common Sense established Jay Huss's kind of signature sound, then Big Conspiracy is him completely distinguishing himself from sounding like anyone else making music in the UK right now. My number two, which has been flip-flopping with my number one for weeks now. I, it's so marginal between these last two albums. My number two is another collab album. That's Freddie Gibbs and The Alchemist with Alfredo. I think Freddie Gibbs has been and is one of the strongest rappers working right now, I think. 
I think in 10 to 20 years time, people are going to look back on his 10 year stretch that he's gone on and they're going to recognize him as being one of the best to maybe ever do it. In order to effectively distinguish yourself from every other gangster rapper that's working out there, because there's so many of them, you have to have something about you, something different. And I think what Freddie Gibbs brings to this table is that he is so self-aware about his lifestyle and he's willing to be open and vulnerable about it as well. The reason why his raps are consistently so entertaining is that while he, he always paints these extremely vivid, dark pictures of the life that he happens to know, he never truly glorifies it or frames it in a way that it sounds appealing to the average listener. He always gives you the good and the bad without any filter. And I think that's why so many people gravitate towards someone like Freddie Gibbs. But when you couple that with the beats of someone like The Alchemist, it's going to be different levels. The beats that The Alchemist provides for Freddie Gibbs on this album, they create the backdrop, they create the canvas so effectively for Freddie Gibbs to do his thing. And what, what I like is that when you hear the beat, before you even get any rapper spitting on it, you can kind of tell what the song is going to be about or the kind of mood that it's going to portray. Like when you first hear the instrumental to Skinny Sugar, it's much darker than the rest of the album and you know that it's going to be very different. And that's the one song where Freddie Gibbs is at his most vulnerable and perhaps it's the darkest song on the album as well. Of course, Freddie Gibbs has, or in my opinion, he has two certified classics with Mad Lib in the shape of Piñata and Bandana. And he's got another one with another legendary hip hop producer like The Alchemist. And I can't think of many others, if any other rapper that can say that. And finishing the list, my number one favorite album of 2020 is Clipping's Visions of Bodies Being Burned. This album is essentially a continuation or companion piece to their existence and addiction to blood, which dropped almost exactly a year prior to the release of this album. Of course, every, every Clipping album is very, very conceptually driven. Um, whether that be as an album as a whole or the individual songs. Um, and and the, the, the concept for these two albums were these kind of horror film inspired little snippets, short film vignettes in song form. Now that aspect of, of, well, of David Diggs' songwriting has always been there, especially on tunes like Body and Blood from, from the self-titled, but they went full throttle and lent into it 100% with these two releases. And I think the reason why I think that Visions of Body Being Burned is even better than the preceding album is that they went even further down that dark, twisted, strange, disturbing rabbit hole. Some of the songs on here, when if you showed me just the concept on paper alone, I would be intrigued. Um, like the song Pain Every Day, where David Diggs is rapping from the perspective of this seemingly deceased man who's viewing all the or the ceremony that us as humans have conjured up to celebrate the life of, of people who have passed away. And he's infuriated because they aren't aware that the true pain starts when you die. That concept, of, I, 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 if that was a film, I would watch that film, but he's able to, well, all, all three of them, his producers as well, they're all able to craft these very, very big, really conceptual ideas into a three or four minute song. Clipping have been known, of course, for their incorporation of noise and industrial music into their hip hop music. And again, they've done that all over this album, but they also take influences from a wide range of different genres. Like the song Say The Name, which takes some very heavy cues from Southern hip hop, or the song Enlacing, which takes some very, very strong inspiration from kind of EDM and dance and trance music. And what they do is it, they don't just give you these very, very horrific, scary stories to listen to. They provide their own new, interesting spins and takes on traditional horror stories. And what they do with these songs is that they don't just give you boring takes on traditional horror stories. They bring their own new, fresh and exciting ideas. Uh, like on the song She Bad, where they flip the idea of a traditional witch hunt or on something underneath where they bring a new perspective to the idea of a zombie apocalypse. And I think the most creative way that they flip these traditional ideas is on the song Check the Lock, where it feels like they're trying to change or recontextualize the meaning of what it means to be 
horrific or what something has to be to be considered horror where they're exploring the psyche of this guy who's clearly some kind of major crime boss and exploring his intense paranoia. And you can imagine that in that situation, it must feel like you're living through some fucked up horror film. The instrumentals are the most creative I've ever heard clipping instrumentals and that same thing because their instrumentals are always so imaginative and disturbing and left the field. But what, what they've done on this on this album is that every every single sliver of instrumental, every single section of the instrumental is inherently linked to the lyrics and you can't really take one without the other. They're inherently linked. I think that's a very, very rare thing to find, especially in, in the medium of hip hop where every single aspect of the song is so meticulous that there, there's no room for anything else. And I think with an album like this, it's I, I really hope that it shows if, if people haven't been introduced to Clipping's music yet, it shows that you can truly make music and write and rap about anything that you want as long as the writing is good. I mean, one of the songs on here is about the fucking Candyman, and it's amazing. The Visions of Bodies Being Bird for me is the most all-encompassing and creative album of the year, and that is why it is my favorite project of 2020. So those are my favorite albums of 2020, favorite albums of the year. Let me know in the comments down below what some of your favorite projects of 2020 are. Make sure to like, subscribe, and dong the bell, and I shall see you next time.